welcome to the sixth talk of cap stock series so last month uh, we traveled across protein sequences and this month we are we will be exploring protein structures so let's hear about cool path towards protein coding commitments over to you ma'am yeah thank you shailya uh, yeah yes as shailya had mentioned uh, we have or uh, we are now traversing into the structural theme and for us uh, and for me especially uh, the structural protein structural work is the most uh, uh, favorite and is very close to my our hearts and uh, we benefit a lot from structures we learn a lot from protein structures and we are still learning uh, over uh, what uh, we wanted to share today are four different stories uh, one of them is uh, uh, to uh, examine uh, proteins which look similar and uh, are evolutionally related, that means they are belong to the same super family. And then to ask the question which parts and of these uh, aligned set of uh, protein sequences uh, that belong to the same super family are varying. And varying in the sense not just appearing as indels, but within an alignment can we pick up conserved features. And the story began like this, you know, because as I said in the sequence theme, uh, we and that in the very first talk on sequence searches, we are interested in structural motifs. So that's uh, one part which is very useful because they serve in that sense as constraints in and to improve the specificity of sequence searches, right? Uh, for instance, we had talked about method transferences and then the structural motifs and how it becomes harder and harder you bring in super family because there is structural variation going on all over, even including the structural motifs. So it becomes quite hard uh, to recognize them. But uh, what I'm going to show you next is an example of another super family where not, there are not just structural variations going on within the core, within the structural motifs or whatever, but there are structural variations that are so vivid that they appear as embellishments, right? And the extent of embellishments between the super family members could be different. And therefore, uh, it can be pretty exhausting trying to uh, um, align them, compare them, or even just to agree upon the fact that they are in, in the similar and belong to the same super family. That being the case, uh, I was just uh, talking about it when I was visiting uh, Professor Bernard Offman's lab. Uh, back in, I think, 2008 uh, or so 2006, actually, and I was lamenting about these uh, sort of uh, length embellishments. And during the conversation, uh, it was Ben uh, actually, he brought, he uh, told uh, some of them act as like giants, some of them are like dwarfs, and he said, yeah, dwarfs and giants, and we like the term a lot. And that's uh, when we started working on these uh, structural variations, as it were. Uh, you know, uh, literally in bioinformatics, uh, computational um, challenges, or I say challenges become an opportunity because uh, in bioinformatics, for instance, we start to uh, categorize the challenges, try to understand what sort of difficulties are there so that uh, we can begin to address them uh, in a class specific manner. So uh, that means we have to uh, engage in objective algorithms, right? So today's talk, in fact, are all going to be on algorithms. And uh, I then talked to Sandhya Shankaran, who had joined uh, our lab as a PhD student at that time after the visit. And then I told the, so I think we should really start with structure-based sequence alignments of the families and begin to code so that we can recognize which regions are concerned and which regions are not concerned. And Sandra is very adept at coding. And she immediately took to the idea and started the work. And uh, that's where our journey began in this CUSP project. But it actually continued so beautifully, actually, uh, because after Sandhya uh, stern, uh, Ishita joined uh, the lab. And uh, in fact, uh, having understood that what sort of variations go on in the structural terms, uh, we then uh, became prepared to look in the sequence uh, arena and to accept homologs, which indeed uh, will be encourage and accept uh, protein relatives whose sequence variations are there. So that turned out to be a very uh, tough pipeline to establish. It took us years to come up with uh, this pipeline that was uh, done by Ishita and she extended to, to uh, organize all this as a LEN bar DB. But uh, in today's talk, unfortunately, we don't have the time to uh, go through all the details uh, of uh, LENVA DB. However, I'm going to uh, just tell you how this uh, 
cusp algorithm works, right? And the cusp algorithm uh, requires uh, alignments. Alignments are protein domain superfamilies. That's a start point. And then uh, we uh, then it begins to uh, examine the code. The cusp code will begin to look at the structurally organized and conserved parts, the strand being strand, being strand and strand. So one, these are conserved. And sometimes uh, it's not just uh, indents. It's not just insertions and deletions. Sometimes you can have uh, a helix that is getting exchanged to a strand and then be a coil and so on. So uh, Sandra's algorithm is um, able to um, accept these sort of uh, variations such that the secondary structures themselves could be different, not can consider this equivalent and they don't remain concerned. And then the algorithm was going to just start by organizing the structurally conserved facts and then the structurally unconserved blocks. And this is going to be explained by Sandhya very soon, the SSPEs and the USPs. And uh, we then went on to categorize what sort of variations are going on, which are the length rigid superfamilies, which are the length deviant superfamilies, it doesn't mean that the length rigid superfamilies are, are bad. Uh, it's just that they can still have functional variety. But more often, the length deviant superfamilies have all sorts of functional variety. And this particular table is kind of summarizing that, which was investigated by Sanya. And uh, you will see that uh, length variations can impact function in all levels. Substrate specificity being different, the way they recognize other proteins could be different, and also they how they participate in higher order complexes also could be different. And these seem to be usually achieved by means of small indentations, not a very long loop, and that's it. Like if it's a 30 rescue loop, it's sometimes partitioned into uh, and, and divided into two or three loops, and they all seem to bear that length variation. And that seems to give the capacity for them to vary in their function as well. Uh, so without much ado, uh, let me uh, request Sandhya, who has come online, to explain the cusp algorithm to us. Sandhya, please. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, ma'am. And thanks, everybody, for a wonderful opportunity to go back to a PhD problem, which is very close uh, to my heart. So, uh, so as ma'am mentioned, uh, we, my time in the lab was uh, uh, in the year, uh, uh, between the years 2003 and 2009. Um, maybe I should just share my screen. Uh, okay. So my time in the lab was uh, between 2003 and 2009, and uh, ma'am came and uh, spoke about this problem on uh, uh, variability in uh, domains, uh, domain lengths. And uh, as a primer to that, uh, actually, um, yeah, primer to that, I mean, I'd just like to give you this uh, analogy of something uh, 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 which we use very regularly. Of course, these are all surgical forceps to the right. And uh, when you look at them very, you know, uh, uh, very superficially, then you can see broadly they have the same kind of a structure or scaffold. But uh, when you look at them, I mean, especially at their tips, uh, you can easily appreciate that there are very, very fine differences in the way they grasp uh, an object, for example. And uh, this is very true when we look around us uh, in the protein universe world also. Now, uh, very often when we look at protein structures, especially those which we know are involved in similar functions, when you look at them, you see a very, very large number of gross similarities. And uh, as an example over here, I have shown you five representative structures of members of the cytochrome C superfamily. And um, um, uh, visually, anybody can tell that at least they should have about three helices, which are arranged uh, fairly orthogonal to each other. However, also what is very evident is that despite this common orthogonal uh, arrangement of helices, there are some units or embellishments which exemplify or differentiate each member of the superfamily. And what can these differences be? These differences can be in the form of longer loops. Some of them are in the form of additional secondary structures. But overall, all of them help or do not disrupt conserved core, which is what is a, a characteristic of the cytochrome C superfamily. So protein length variation somehow seems to be quite gently accommodated into a structural scaffold without really disturbing the scaffold and yet adding its own embellishments or variety to the family. Um, is this unique 
uh, feature of certain superfamilies. But really, when we look around us in uh, proteins from various classes, such as the alpha class or the beta class, so here are representatives from, from each of these classes over here, lipases, Rossman fold like members, and um, you know, lysozyme-like uh, members. And in all of them, uh, there are certain elements that are fairly conserved. Uh, okay. But there are also certain embellishments which are, which are very easily evident when we examine or compare these structures. So therefore, uh, as ma'am also, also mentioned, almost every protein superfamily, when you start looking at the members individually at their structures, we can recognize that there are some giants and there are some dwarf domains. And yet, overall, they all seem to be involved or engaged in some sort of a similar functional role. So we looked at this, um, uh, I, mean, I mean, how do you capture these differences in length? And, and for that, we thought that the, I mean, it, it would become a very subjective uh, you know, uh, decision making. Therefore, we needed an objective algorithm. And that's where we started looking at uh, an algorithm which we named as CUSP. Uh, which is, the, as, the, as the name suggests, the recognition of conserved units of structure in proteins. And a good starting point for these alignments was already there with us in the form of the past two superfamily alignments. Now, these superfamily level alignments were generated um, uh, in, in such a way that initial equivalences between secondary structures were specified by the use of programs such as STAMP. And uh, therefore, we were quite sure that uh, when we are looking at a multiple sequence alignment of a protein superfamily member, we're already looking at regions which have a fairly high conservation of structural elements, right? So as shown over here in this schematic, um, when we look at an, a superfamily level alignment, there would be regions where almost all of the members would have strands in the same position or helices in the same position and so on. So this is how structural alignments really look like. But um, so, so the aim of CUSP was really to delineate such regions of core secondary structures, which we call as secondary structural blocks, from regions that did not really conserve any form of secondary structure, which we uh, intuitively called as unconserved structural blocks or USBs. And um, uh, so, so that was the core aim of, uh, uh, you know, of the CUSP algorithm. And uh, once we identified such secondary structural blocks from unstructured, unstructured regions, we also did, uh, uh, took the effort of looking at a mapping of their solvent accessibility in such regions. So, so this was also inbuilt into the programs only to improve the accuracy with which we are aligning regions that are known to adopt the same secondary structure. And uh, once we had these regions, the idea was to look at if there are going to be a large number of indels or insertions and deleted regions in protein superfamily level alignments, then uh, how do we characterize these? I mean, uh, do, do, uh, is it useful information to recognize those protein domain superfamilies that generally do not show much variation in length from others which are highly deviant in length? And I will get to, the, uh, to, to how we took these decisions in, in a bit. But essentially, we were able to recognize from about 353 superfamily alignments, at least 24 superfamilies that were that we classified as length rigid and not showing too much variation in length, and at least 64 protein superfamilies that show tremendous uh, variation in length. And having done this exercise, of course, we are always curious to know what kind of functional correlate such regions can add on to any protein. Why would a protein uh, superfamily have both giant and dwarf members and broadly still be able to do the same kind of function, overall function? So this was the aim of uh, CUSP. And uh, so here is an alignment from PAS2. Uh, this is obviously a, a representative alignment. So there are only four sequences which are shown here for these. And for each of these, we now looked at mapping the secondary structures, which we derived from the DSSP assignments. We also use the uh, solvent accessibility mapping onto these structures to recognize core regions, which we would name as either highly conserved uh, uh, helices or uh, helices or highly conserved strands, and regions, and, 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 and there might be some regions which also have highly conserved coil regions or linker regions. 
And our scoring scheme was such that uh, when you had very, very high conservation of the same type of secondary structure assignment as we move one step, one position to another in the alignment, we would, we would mark these and score them very, very high, giving an assignment of about five. Where there was a replacement in at least one member having some deviation, but at least 75% members uh, or position uh, of residues at a particular position showing a, a conserved residue type or a structural type, we would score it as 3.75. And where we were looking at unconserved regions or gaps uh, aligning with each other, we gave it a very, very poor score. So therefore, ultimately at the end of this exercise of mapping the secondary structures onto the alignment, recognizing the structural blocks from unconserved blocks, we were in, able, we were in effect able to identify highly conserved blocks, medium conserved blocks or poorly conserved blocks, which is what I'm showing here through this representation, highly conserved strands, highly conserved helices and so on. So the, when we then looked at these unconserved regions, okay, so highly conserved regions, of course, the fact that they are very well conserved across the members of the protein superfamilies immediately suggests that these are forming the structural core. But our interest was looking at the length variant regions. So when we look at the distribution of the length ranges across the various uh, members, then we find that, uh, that there are very, very few which show uh, uh, a high deviation in length from the average domain length of the, uh, uh, or, or, or the, or the length of that block. And um, uh, although length variations are universally seen across all the members in the protein superfamilies, some such as in the alpha beta superfamilies which were able to accommodate higher length variations and by that we mean at least in the range of about 50 to 100 residues um, and uh, when we look at the actual lengths of the indels in the various uh, you know major classes uh, and looked at how many of them showed only about um, uh, show very very high variation in length and uh, we call these as the length deviant superfamilies, the ones where uh, they were having a variability greater than 30% of the mean domain size. Whereas the length rigid superfamilies were a smaller set of about 24, where they, were, uh, 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 they showed less than 10% variation in length in their mean domain size. And uh, as you can see, across the various classes, this trend is fairly uh, uniformly conserved. So you would have length deviant superfamilies and length rigid superfamilies now identified in various members or uh, various uh, structural classes of fruit. And uh, um, intuitively, one always imagines that um, indels are likely to, add to, you know, to generally occur as coils. But uh, we went on to look at whether regions that were indels, which in our definition are actually unconserved regions, right? So they may have, or one or two members may acquire some form of secondary structure. We gently saw that uh, it is not necessary that they are all coils, that in many cases, such as in the alpha beta class, at least 50% of these indels or, uncons or um, you know, unconserved structural blocks are actually made up of helices. And uh, whereas in the case of the alpha class, then a, a, a slightly higher than, uh, you know, uh, about 56% uh, uh, lie, uh, occur as coils. So indels also can acquire secondary structure and, and, and adopt a particular shape. And uh, when we look at the average length of the indels, you know, are these short, are these only two to three residues in length, or can they span much larger lengths? Because when we looked at giants and dwarfs, we do know that there are certain superfamilies which have at least twofold to threefold variation in length between related members of the same protein superfamily. And uh, so, therefore, we, a general trend we noticed in all the classes were that multiple short indels are preferred rather than having a much longer indel which will connect or uh, or or um, or, or form some a decorative element in the structure. It is really a, a, a sum total of a number of shorter length structures that can, uh, that can uh, add value to the protein scaffold. Um, so we went on in, in the phase two of this project to look at what kind of consequences the structural scaffold uh, would, uh, would have to face as uh, uh, when it had to accommodate such large variations in length. 
And we generally saw that there were three main categories into which our data sets uh, fit into. And these are summarized over here in the interest of time. So first is that majority of these length variability is observed in protein domain superfamilies that tend to exist as structural repeats. That is the same domain uh, occurring in repeated contexts, either in tandem on a single chain or in multiple chains. And alternatively, some of these uh, additional lengths or uh, embellishments generally helped a protein domain to exist as a multi-domain protein and contributed to the socialness of a domain. And uh, uh, so th th uh, in those days, we were looking at uh, which domain families are, are promiscuous in nature and like to associate with multiple other superfamilies. And I'm sure that there will be a number of talks on this, on this theme as well in, in, in future presentations from the lab. Uh, but we looked at how many of our length domain superfamilies, length deviant superfamilies also fit into this category. And uh, lo and behold, when we looked at some superfamilies, I already mentioned that they can exist as repeats. When we actually looked at these repeating domains and superimposed them one on top of the other, we find that the structural core is extremely well conserved. In fact, about 75% to 80% of the core is, can, can superimpose quite well at an RMSD lower than 1.5 Armstrong. And um, uh, indeed, when we looked at the 27 length deviant superfamilies, we find that, um, it, that, that there is a good number uh, which were actually existing as repeating domains where the additional lengths which are shown, which, are, which, which I'm pointing out to over here in some of these domain superfamilies may contribute some additional functional role, which could be interaction with the neighboring domain or interaction with a completely different uh, partnering protein uh, altogether. And uh, um, also many of these proteins we found like to occur in multi-domain context. And that is of course true for a very large number of protein domain superfamilies in itself. And uh, 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 like I briefly mentioned, some of them may be in multi-domain contexts, either within the same chain or in multiple chains as well. This was another trend that we observed. Um, and, um, um, and of course, when you have a large number of variability and uh, the presence of a number of extraneous loops, some of them almost looking like an entirely different or a new domain altogether, as we saw in the case of the phosphoribosyl transferase domain, uh, we would see that many of these help to anchor a number of not only intra-subunit interactions, but also interactions with neighboring subunits from other proteins as well, so as the case of the SAM domain. And um, another example in the form of the viral proteins, where in capsid proteins, which, which, uh, which uh, generally uh, occur as higher order oligomers made up of multiple subunits and uh, um, with each subunit having at least uh, typically um, uh, two forms, uh, two jelly rows. Uh, this, this is the most basic uh, uh, nomenclature adopted by these proteins. Now, uh, the two jelly rows may well be conserved between the uh, individual subunits, but look at the variability in length. And uh, this variability in length suggests that the huge variety that you see in viral protein structures or viral capsid-like structures may be uh, a consequence of uh, such large embellishments uh, that are typical of some of these protein families. So um, as, um, as also summarized uh, earlier, so broadly, when we looked at every uh, one of these length deviant superfamilies, we found that the extra embellishments fit into multiple roles. Beautifully, they contributed to the stability of the domain or dictated domain size in itself and uh, the minimum domain size. Some of them added to the multiple repeat contexts of certain domain superfamilies, such as the arm repeat and TPR repeats, which are known to lie in different numbers and different contexts and uh, uh, resulting in producing a completely new interface for interactions with other proteins. And uh, likewise, some of them also had regulatory roles and uh, um, involvement in higher order complexes, such as in the case of the viral jelly role. So with this, I would uh, like to summarize some of our studies on the, uh, on the development of the CUSP al algorithm as an objective scoring scheme
to recognize structurally conserved blocks from unconserved blocks in proteins. And this objectivity helped to identify structural cores and also recognize those protein superfamilies where large variations in length can be accommodated. And such variability in length can help to understand what are the limits by which uh, of alignment length filters that you might want to apply in any sequence search algorithms for newer members of this protein superfamily. Likewise, newer members of this protein superfamily, we could use this information to also look at um, uh, you know, how, much, uh, how, how much variability you want to show in the case of the loop regions when you, when you perform a modeling exercise. So studies like this are useful to make these broad sort of overreaches as well. And uh, so uh, back to you, ma'am, uh, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sandhya. It was a very uh, neat presentation. And also, it kind of sets the stage uh, for um, impressing that the length variations could have impact on uh, a number of uh, uh, functional um, definitions. Uh, most importantly, uh, how this might uh, affect how the protein remains have the capacity to interact with other proteins or to other protein domains themselves. And uh, this is uh, so crucial uh, because that's what we are going to talk about in the next. We stay on, Sandhya, for the question mm -hmm. questions. So as we go along uh, to the next uh, topic, which is on the dog school. And um, continuing on that, you know, since protein-protein interactions are uh, affected by these sort of length variations and their capacity to, uh, with, you know, bring in a variety um, and also to just know how two proteins might interact. There are a number of uh, docking, physics-based docking algorithms. And what worried us uh, when we were as, uh, being active users is that usually we just are thrown um, back uh, a number of decoys. Decoy means a number of uh, possible solutions of how two proteins, uh, say A and B, uh, could interact with each other. And these solutions, um, have the possibility, have the strength that you, the user can choose what is more biologically meaningful, but from the structural principles can be uh, recognized that in the absence of any biochemical data, and especially in the absence of uh, the crystal structure itself, which is like the gold standard, um, you know, the crystal structure of the AB complex. So with this in mind, uh, when Sony Malhotra joined our lab, she not only worked on DNA binding proteins as we have heard last year, Last week, uh, she had also participated and uh, worked on this um, scoring algorithm wherein we purposely took 30 uh, crystal structures of protein protein complexes. Some of them are the AA type and some of them are the AB type. And then uh, we would uh, pretend as though we don't know how they interact. And plus, we will purposely move the one of the chains here and there random move translations and rotations so that they are nowhere within interacting distance anymore, and then subject them to the usual uh, docking algorithms. And it was not only throw off, we tried a few more as well. And then the algorithm would uh, throw back hundreds of poses, right? So we, we will take 99 of them, and the hundredth pose is usually the crystal, the crystal structure, and we call it as a native pose. And then we would ask the question, uh, if we did not know how the structure of the AB complex or the AA complex is going to look like, uh, can we pick up the best pose by means of attributing some structural features and then convert them into scores and see how far the sort of uh, met scoring method help us to know which of the 100 poses uh, is closer to the native pose. That is, let us say you have an AB complex uh, and then you have a number of uh, decoys. Are there any of the decoys that are, uh, bring the B subunit close to, as we see, in the crystal structure? And this is then objectively examined through the lens of phylogeny, where we simply supply RMSD or uh, the structural deviations as an input. And uh, Sony uh, decided that the top five members that cluster close to the crystal structure, the native structure, are treated as the um, correct molecules, and if they also get high score, then it is a success. So uh, we have with us Revati, who is now continuing that project, uh, and she is going to explain uh, what these structural features are about. Revati, please. Thank you, Sandhya. Uh, 
So we know that the cellular environment uh, is a very crowded environment and that there are a lot of proteins that are constantly interacting in order to drive a lot of different cellular processes. And um, like uh, Ma'am has already explained, uh, in order to understand the functions of these proteins better, it is always a nice idea to um, study their structures and uh, see um, what information we can gain from that. So uh, when it comes to determining the structures of uh, proteins experimentally, we have uh, an array of different, uh, of different techniques like uh, X-ray and uh, electron microscopy, NMR, and so on. And um, a lot of these structures are stored in this uh, database called the Protein Data Bank that is accessible to everyone. And what we see here is, uh, if you look at the graph, um, the plot at the bottom here, you see that most of the protein structures that have been elucidated are structures of single proteins. And we only have around 20% uh, of structures that are actually, com I mean, structures of protein complexes. So when we are trying to understand protein-protein interaction, it kind of uh, becomes imperative that we also have a computational way so that we can predict to have uh, predict these interactions so that we can have some sort of a preliminary understanding of how these two proteins might possibly interact, right? So for example, um, so for example, here, uh, I have two proteins here. We have uh, GY and GA, and these are two chemotaxis proteins uh, from E. coli. Now these two uh, proteins are found uh, when they, are found as a complex in the cell because that's how they perform their functions. Now, when we present uh, these two individual proteins to different docking algorithms, they may choose um, a lot of different ways of docking them. So you can have something that's called rigid body docking, where we consider these two different proteins as entirely rigid bodies, where the structures do not change, there is no conformational change. And we just try to see how they fit together as pieces of a puzzle without changes in any other part of the protein. You can have something called flexible docking where uh, the algorithm allows for some motion of certain parts of these protein structures while uh, trying to predict the structure of the complex. You can also have something called guided docking where you may input the interacting residues Give the, algorithm, uh, give the algorithm the information that these are the residues that are interacting, and then it will uh, make predictions based on that information. And you can also have something called blind docking, where you provide the algorithm with absolutely no information. You just give it the two complexes, and the algorithm, based on various different parameters, tries to find the best possible pose. Now, docking algorithms typically give uh, you know, they predict a lot of different poses, like Ma'am pointed out uh, when she was explaining uh, dog score. Uh, you can have 99 poses, 100 poses. It, they give out a lot of different poses. And the challenge here is to identify the pose that is the closest to the uh, native structure. So what we call a near native pose. And this is where the dog score algorithm comes in. Dog score uh, uses a lot of different objective parameters. Uh, to identify the pose that is the closest to the native pose. So the first thing is it starts out by identifying the interacting residues from the two different interfaces. And for this, it uses a seven angstrom cutoff. And then what it looks at are different parameters like the change in exposed surface area when, uh, you know, when two different proteins are bound together. Then it also looks at the conservation of interfacial residues because we know that residues at the interface tend to be conserved because they are important for the interaction. DocScore also looks at short contacts and uh, scores them appropriately. It also looks at spatially clustered residues. Uh, so these are uh, clusters of residues on the protein-protein interaction interface. And it also looks at hydrophobicity because we know that a lot of um, protein interfaces tend to have hydrophobic residues at the core of the interface. In addition to this, it can also, uh, DOCS core can also take into account uh, positively, the presence of positively charged residues at the interface. And um, 
here I'll just give you a brief overview of Proxco performance. So the first example here on the left is from uh, the paper that came out in 2015. So here uh, the purple part of the chain that you see here, this is the first protein chain from the native complex. So this has been kept uh, the same. And what we'll be looking at is the second chain of the complex. Where, and here in yellow, we have the chain from the native complex. And in green, we have the chain from the best ranked host. So the first ranked host is obviously the native complex itself. And the second one is what are top ranking poses. And here the green represents the top ranking pose. The blue and the red uh, segments here are just a ball and stick model for the interface residues of each of these poses. As an, and as we can see here, these are uh, highly overlapping with a very small RMSD. For comparing doc score to other um, algorithms that also score different docking poses, uh, there, uh, we have this uh, line chart here that was part of the paper that came out in 2014. And here we can see that um, doc score is being compared to two different algorithms called DD Fire and FireDoc. And in, on, in practically all of these cases, DocScore does a better job of identifying the native versus the top ranking post when we're looking at RMSD. And uh, here, um, for my last slide, I have a snapshot of the DocScore web server. You can find it here at uh, caps.ncbs.res.in slash DocScore. And you can see here that uh, we can, there are multiple options to upload our doc poses and the native files, the native protein structures. And we can also choose which of the parameters we would like to consider when we're trying to score our different doc decoys. And uh, there are several different options to check the conservation of the residues. And here is how you can submit the choice. So thank you, thanks. That's great. Uh, thank you, David. And uh, you know, it's very uh, interesting that in the absence of the crystal structure data, how well are we able to recognize best uh, poses? And uh, also, are we able to recognize some unifying structural principles and parameters that help us to pick up that one best pose from a huge set of these calls? Uh, having known that the doc score has been doing well, uh, I do believe that. We should keep learning a lot more, and we will do that. And uh, off to the next topic. So we have heard two stories so far. One is on the cusp, uh, which is a conserved unit in uh, structures of protein, given the structures of proteins, and then uh, the dog score, which helps us, in fact, uh, to recognize uh, best pores. And we uh, do not make use of the structural information of the protein protein complex in the process. Fine. And uh, the third and the fourth stories are somewhat related. And also it's very, very uh, close to our hearts because it's one of the oldest. And uh, the story really began when uh, we had an annual talk uh, in TIFR back in 1999, a year after our lab had been set up. And um, I, um, Ray in uh, the Department of Biological Sciences TFR had come up with the uh, question uh, during a uh, lunch session. And uh, since we are uh, people interested in structures and we are structural bioinformaticians, he said uh, he is handling a pro protein protein interaction, which happens to be the special type as shown on the right hand side, which are called coils. And there, one mutation is making uh, the Drosophila uh, become uh, dead. That means it's called as a lethal mutation. And on the other hand, if you if you put another mutation, say 30 residues away, uh, the drosophila is alive. That's called as a rescue mutation. And then he wanted us to know uh, what, what may be going on and whether we can provide a structural rationale. So we knew uh, it is much more than just um, appreciating that there's, uh, these sort of events go on. And at that time, Anirban Badri, my second PhD student, whose work you'd have heard uh, a great deal in the sequence thing uh, on I'm, uh, interacting motives and so on, and genders and so on. He also uh, happened to work with us on this project. And then he uh, modeled these coil coil domains in three dimension. And then he came up with some um, objective reasons why this may be happening. 
and the reason is simple he said this could be because of charge effect and uh, this uh, was quite convincing to us but back in my mind and uh, this was going uh, this was uh, back in our, my mind and think, i was thinking that how nice it will be if we can drive it through an objective algorithm or a measure by which we can look at uh, the sort of uh, interactions at coil coils and that is when uh, vikram alva joined our lab and vikram uh, happens to be the if i'm right the first uh, batch uh, of post msc uh, students in the institute of bioinformatics and applied biotechnology in the same city in bangalore and vikram uh, was closely working with me so close that desk was behind me and also he was directly guiding him so it was a very fun exercise because i was uh, trying to uh, give him uh, ideas about how to use the very well known the ramachandran sort of uh, principles where we uh, think of the total energy uh, of a system as a sum of uh, van der waal hydrogen bond and electrostatic interactions and uh, we are only looking at the uh, enthalpic part therefore and the um, plan was to concentrate at the interface of these uh, proteins that uh, engage in coil coil and then attribute the sort of pseudo energies so that we can begin to recognize uh, which are stable systems which are weak systems if they are weak systems which regions are um, causing this weakness and so on and back again uh, this meant we could apply these sort of uh, uh, principles of taking the total energy as a sum of these three components and uh, that's when the coil check really began but it did not stop there because then divya joined the lab and she applied them uh, this uh, principle on an algorithm coil check on myosin and margaret uh, later on uh, took it forward uh, to uh, improve the coil check algorithm wherein we care for the hydrogen bonds we applied distance dependent dielect um, dielectric constant so that the electrostatics are better described and um, also Ma margaret had uh, specifically then uh, brought up a, a module of coil check plus which i called as chaco by the way i call all these names uh, of algorithms and uh, yeah we just debate a little bit and then we stick to one name and also equally important i think is to um, kind of pause and uh, recognize that these five and a half uh, seminars that we have had so far i would have mentioned the term funding or grants only a couple of times once to discuss a welcome trust grant that came in 1999 and then uh, uh in sorry 2000 and then i had talked about my very first uh, indian grant which was a department of biotechnology grant and all the other projects that i have described so far are all from internal funds the funds that came from ncbs tifr and we are uh, the lab is very grateful for the uh, nice funding that we have been obtained from our parent institutes anyway to go back to the coil check story uh, what margaret is going to do uh, is to explain um, the process of how coil check coil check was converted into coil check plus how the chaho was uh, useful to uh, understand myosins because we kind of went into a much better commitment on myosins by jointly uh, working and uh, um, getting a human frontier science program grant uh, which meant we were formally collaborating with the uh, scientists like professor james pudich of stanford university professor hendrik pryberg of the copenhagen university and i was the principal investigator for that grant where only we theorized that we were able to uh, make these three dimensional models of many different myosins that people have never handled so far and they are from different genomes can we use coil check and recognize the weak regions so that it can be iteratively tested that indeed such weaknesses have a functional reason so with this in mind we collaborated also with be life technologies a company and particularly uh, this gentleman here had the uh, primarily been working with us same with obadiah so without much ado let me um, invite uh, margaret uh, to tell her part of the story but before i do i'll also tell you that this naturally just lent uh, itself the project lent itself to ask the next question which is why stop and look only at those those proteins which are coil coil in nature can be instead um, sorry are you able to see the slides are you seeing a four, set of four photos yes because uh, i yeah it's fine now uh, okay so then we asked the question can we then apply to 
protein-protein uh, protein interactions of all the globular um, proteins uh, for, whose, uh, for whom we have structural information available. And that is what Anshul Sukhwal had uh, next done. And he improvised the coil check pro program and completely directed it so that we can now start looking at global protein protein interactions. And for this, he very carefully chair chose uh, the data set and then uh, standardized uh, and pseudo energies that are acceptable. And this went into a very organized and committed sort of five year program grant that was completely funded by the Department of Biotechnology. Uh, it was called as a Center for Excellence of Computational System Biology. As you can see, two of the R&D projects, which themselves are clear ones, are completely right on dot on protein-protein interactions. So they all kind of revolve around the PP check team. And this was in um, collaboration with two other uh, computational scientists and one wet lab uh, biologist who is uh, Professor Tejit Meyer. Uh, however, uh, this is the order. First, we will hear from Margaret about uh, the coin check, coin check plus Chapo, and then from Anshul, uh, who will talk about the PP check. And I'm not really referring to the kind of work that had gone in by Prashant and Malini, who had uh, dedicated their time on uh, looking at hotspots, namely important residues at the interface, and also the work of uh, Oman Matthew who then went on to particularly apply um, the PP check on large protein protein assemblies, all that we could make a uh, place a hand on. And then he had created a repository called PMRDB. In the interest of time, we, we will not be able to talk about PMRDB or the hotspots that were um, taken up by Prashant the Molini. But we have Margaret and Anshul online, and they are going to describe their part of these two stories. Uh, yeah. So, Margaret, please. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the introduction. Uh, I'm uh, Margaret Sunita. I am a bioinformatics slash uh, genetic researcher. I work in Mass General Hospital affiliated to Harvard Medical School and uh, the Broad Institute. So I'm a very proud alumni of the CAPS lab, and I feel so privileged uh, to be mentored by Professor Soldamni, ma'am. And uh, in today's presentation, I'm going to talk about the suite of algorithms that were built to study coil-coil structures. And um, I will talk about the usage of coil check, coil check plus, and the Chaho algorithms. Before going into the details of the algorithms, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to the coil-coil domains by themselves. So coil coils are uh, simple structural units, which are which consist of two or more alpha helices, which intertwine together to form a rope-like architecture. They are uh, present as dimers, trimers, or tetramers, or even higher order structures. And these coil coils also have um, unique seven residue repeat pattern, and these, res these repeats are called as heptids. In an ideal situation, uh, the a, uh, in the A and D position, the seven residues, in the seven residues, the A and D position of the heptid is occupied by hydrophobic amino acid, and the rest of the positions are occupied by polar amino acids. And specifically, the E and G position of the heptid uh, has charged amino acid or electrostatic amino acids. And, and the presence of specific um, amino acids in these positions leads to a unique um, packing of the coil coils, which is called as the knob into hole interaction, which forms um, where one residue from the A or D position of the coil coil heptid, the hydrophobic uh, amino acid forms the knob and packs into a hole that is created by rest of the few other amino acids from the other helix. So this knob into hole interaction of coil coil is very important for its stability and plays a very important role in its function as well. So um, having said that um, the stability of the coil coil is important, there are multiple studies which have shown that certain regions on the coil coil structure are highly stable when compared to certain other regions. As, as what man talked about in the Drosophila story, there is 
an amino acid in one position of the coil coil, which has one effect, whereas the other position has a different effect, right? Functional effect. So this is, and this could be because uh, the stability of the coil coil is compromised at one, whereas not in the other. So there are multiple studies that shows that the most stable region on the coil coil structure is present for a purpose. And the most weak region on the coil coil is also present for a purpose where they have shown that these regions interact with other proteins. The coil coils are also found in different superfamily of proteins. Um, they are present as shorter uh, structures, as in case of leucine zippers, nucle nucleocapsid proteins, repressors, or autotransporters. They are also present as transcription factors interacting with DNA molecules. And uh, they are also present as long length coil coils, which are, which which travels like thousands of amino acids together, as in the family of tropomyosin and um, myosins. So having said that coil coils are present in different superfamily and the stability of the coil coil plays an important role, um, uh, what are we trying to understand using the coil check and uh, the updated coil check plus and Chaho algorithm? We wanted to uh, identify stable and unstable zones on coil coils. As I mentioned, these unstable uh, zones on the coil coils are there for a purpose. For example, in the transcription factor, the unstable zone is where the coil coil structure interacts with the DNA molecule. And there are other protein protein complexes where the coil coil unstable zone interacts with another protein molecule. So we wanted to identify such regions. And based on that, we wanted to pinpoint certain functionally important hotspots on these coil coils. And this is what we wanted to achieve using coil check and coil check plus algorithms. So first coil check. Uh, uh, Vikram Alva uh, was the main author of this paper where they have developed uh, and, and, and which was also um, where Divya also in, interacted with Alva to get this coil check, first version of coil check uh, method. So uh, basically the method identifies total interprotomer stabilizing energy between the two helices of a coil coil structure. So the way the uh, algorithm works is that uh, provided, an in, provided an input PDB structure and the two helices that we wanted to interrogate, um, the method calculates hydrogen bond energy, electrostatic energy, and van der Waals energy, and sum them up together to get the total interprotomer energy, which is a contribution of energy between the two interacting alpha helices. And this has been normalized based on the number of residues that are present on the coil coil and benchmarked with the set of uh, coil coils that are available at that point of time. And then and then provide us with a, a energy which is which says whether the structure is stable or unstable. So this is the basic algorithm that was developed. In, and in the updated version, Coil Check Plus, we added a couple of more features to it. One is that um, we, we collaborated with VLife Technologies and tried to build a module where we can fix hydrogen atoms into the structure and then calculate these hydrogen uh, bond energies. This is one module. And the second thing, we also added a feature where we can calculate the electrostatic energy based on distance dependent, um, based on the distance between those uh, charged residues. So, so we call this as distance dependent electrostatic calculations. The idea of this is that we wanted to include um, the charged interactions, not only that are close by in the coil coil structures, but also which are far off. So even those far off uh, charged residues could contribute to the electrostatic energy and we wanted to uh, integrate that into the calculations. So we added a couple of more features to it and we have this primary algorithm called coil check plus, which is an updated version of uh, coil check. So what are we, uh, what is the kind of output that we get from coil check or coil check plus algorithm, right? Um, if we provide a, sh a shorter coil coil structure, say for example, a leucine zipper, uh, it will calculate the energy benchmark it against the known coil coils that were available at that point of time and provide us with an energy value which, which could say, say whether it is a stable or an unstable coil coil. But, um, 
And this could be okay when we have a short length coil coil as input. But I did mention that there are long length coil coils available, uh, which from uh, super families like tropomyosin and myosin. So, so when we provide one whole structure of these long length coil coils, the energy value will not tell us the uh, total information of these two structures. We will not be able to identify patches of stable and unstable regions on these long length coil coils. One way is to truncate the structure into small bins and then get the energy, part of the energy and sum them up. But we need some background information to truncate these structures at certain point. So, uh, so in the updated version of coil check plus, we add added another uh, suite of algorithms called Chaho, which I'll talk about it in the next slide, where we had tried to um, score the, the core of the alpha helix, the hydrophobic core of the uh, coil coil, as well as the outer uh, electrostatic patch that also contributes to the energy, right? So we have scored them differently and we used a sliding window-based approach so that we can uh, summarize the entire structure in, in small bins of heptids so that um, the energy or the scored output that we get would be uh, would not only be for the entire structure as one value, but we would get an output or scoring based on the different heptids. And that would lead us to the identification of uh, important regions on these coil coils. And that is what we have tried to achieve using these Chaho uh, algorithm. And this is the overall workflow of the Chaho algorithm. So here uh, provided uh, with the coil coil uh, PDB structure, we start off uh, with identifying the hydrophobic ladder uh, by scoring them based on a simple scoring just based on what is present in the hydrophobic uh, positions or based on a propensity-based scoring where we already know that there are certain hydrophobic residues being um, present in the A and D position than the other. So we score them based on that. And that's the hydrophobic ladder part where the core of the coil coil is scored. And then we and then we try to give it as a visual output. This was first arm of the coil check plus or the Chaho algorithm. The second arm was to look into the electrostatic nature of the coil coils, where we calculated the uh, charge distribution of the coil coil. And then we also applied um, a distance dependent calculation there and a scoring function, which is based on separate heptets. that's called the heptid based scoring scheme or the residue-based scoring scheme where each residue on the heptid is taken and a distance is, is patched around that particular residue to, to identify all the charged residues that are present around this charged uh, you know, a residue that has been considered by the algorithm and then sum up the energy that has been contributed and then we score them. And we identify the stable and unstable heptids based on this charged patch that we get um, based on the uh, charge, res charge residues. And we also did this in two ways, where we considered all the charge residues. Um, as I mentioned, the surface of the coil coil has polar residues and the E and G position are charged in nature, which forms the surface of it. So we considered all of them. But in certain cases, the core was also occupied by a charge residue, and that was there for a purpose. And so the if there are two positively charged residue near the core, it will, it will, it will have a repulsive effect there. And that instability was, was in turn uh, co compensated by another protein interacting to it. So this kind of scenarios in which uh, these unstable zones were, uh, were identified as protein-protein interfaces. So the, the study or, or the identification of these buried charged residues was helpful for us to identify those hotspot regions which were so unstable in these coil coils. So uh, this is an example result of these uh, Chaho uh, algorithms where, um, where given a coil coil structure, it has been divided into multiple heptids based on the seven residue amino acid that we could see. And then we score them based on the electrostatic patch that is the first output. And then the green uh, zones are the more stable regions and the red zones are the more unstable regions. And the second plot is, the is based on the hydrophobicity of the core. 
we score them again based on either simple scoring or propensity based scoring and then provide us and provide the um, the researcher with a graph which will show that this is the more stable zone on the coil coil and there is a dip in this region because of the loss of hydrophobicity in the core region and these are type of outputs that uh, we could get from the chaho algorithm and I just wanted to show the um, web server that we have here, which is called as the coil check plus. Uh, we, uh, this is the updated version of the coil check. We have different uh, utilities here. Uh, one could provide the coil coil structure PDB as an input and the cha chains to be uh, studied and then choose uh, different um, uh, arms of interaction um, uh, uh, of the algorithm. Like we could even choose the all charge residue or buried charge residue or different kind of scoring scheme. And these results of Chaho algorithms can also be accessed uh, through these um, web servers. So uh, I, I, I'm not going into the details of the implementation of it, but I just wanted to uh, talk about the stropomyosin superfamily, where we were very successful in identifying uh, stable and unstable regions on the on the tropomyosin, and we were able to identify hot spots on those region, and and this also went forward. Um, uh, uh, to test a, a hypothesis that we derived based on bioinformatic approaches, based on the application of these algorithms on tropomyosin. And we tested on the bench very successfully uh, on a cardiac tropomyosin um, uh, protein. So I'm not going to the details of that um, uh, work, but I just wanted to point out that uh, the development of these kind of algorithms and application into a specific superfamily helped us identify a novel hotspot and which was even tested on the bench very successfully. And uh, I just wanted to point out multiple pub publications which are actually the application of the method. Um, so um, so as Ma'am mentioned earlier, Divya and Chandrasekhar uh, uh, seniors of our lab, uh, we we kind of collaborated with them to build the myosinome database. Uh, this database harbors um, the coil coil structures of myosin superfamily. It has hundreds of structures being modeled based on a fragment based modeling approach. And we had applied coil check and coil check plus Chaha algorithms onto those coil coil structures. And we have deposited all those results in the myosinome database. And um, we, uh, as I just talked about the tropomyosin story, we have a, a very good application of coil check plus algorithm on tropomyosin. And in fact, um, we went and tested on the bench with other, uh, with cardiomyopathy causing mutation on tropomyosin, known cardiomyopathy mutation, as well as this bioinformatically derived mutation was tested together. And we have a cool story on that. And um, we also went ahead and tested tropomyosin and its interacting partners. Uh, we have a paper on tropomyosin myosin and troponin T, where we have studied the studied this charge interactions between them. And lastly, we also studied the um, myosin head domain and its interaction partners. Uh, this is a these are cool collaborations that we had with Professor Jim Spudich uh, and his lab, both on tropomyosin uh, front and the uh, myosin front. And uh, with this, I would like to stop. And uh... thank you, Margaret. Uh, I, I should. Uh, I should mention that uh, some of these uh, troponin tropomyosin stories, we hope to take it up next month. And I hope uh, Margaret will uh, again be able to come online and explain in her own uh, way. Mm, thank you. Uh, uh, next, uh, we would have uh, Anshul uh, talk about the generalized uh, project algorithm, uh, which can be applied uh, for um, validating and understanding protein protein interactions uh, in general. Anshul, please. Thank you. So uh, today I'll be speaking about PPJ, uh, web server for the quality analysis of protein-protein interfaces and prediction of residue hotspot. So as Devdi mentioned, that proteins do not live in isolation and they interact with each other. So uh, there are three main challenges in the field. One is the prediction of correct binding site or say there, there are two proteins, A and B, whether they will be interacting with one another or not. And if at all, they will be interacting with each other, whether they will be interacting with each other this way, or uh, they will be interacting with each other uh, through this interface. 
or whether they will be interacting with each other through this interface. Now, suppose if we have understood. I cannot uh, see the slides yet. Is it visible now? Yes. Uh, you, you may go to full screen. Yeah. So uh, there are mainly three uh, challenges. One is whether the protein interacts this way or uh, whether the protein interacts this way. Okay, now if we understood that uh, the two proteins interact with one another in this fashion, uh, then uh, not all the interface residue uh, contribute equally towards the uh, stability of these inter interfaces. Some residues contribute more, and then they are called as hotspot residues. Um, so, uh, what we do is uh, we we have created a web server which looks some something like this. Okay, it has several modules like protein protein interactions, hotspot prediction, computational LNN scanning, residue conservation, and prediction of right docking force. Uh, today I will be discussing about the first three that is protein protein interaction, hotspot prediction, and computational LNN scanning. And here uh, how it works is. Like uh, one can uh, feed a PDB ID or uh, put uh, any of the complexes, upload any of the complexes, and uh, the server calculates various energies like hydrogen bond energy, electrostatic energy, as well as Van der Waals energy. All these energies are then summed up as total energy, and only those residues that contributes towards any of these energies are considered as interface residues. Now, the total energy is divided by the number of interface residues to get a normalized energy per residue pool. As informed earlier by ma'am, yeah, so we took a data set of the globular protein from uh, different data sets, which contained a total of 238 different protein PDB IDs and a 262 different uh, PDB chains, like interacting chains. And then we found that it is mostly either the hydrogen bond energy or the Van der Waals energy that contribute towards the stability of these surfaces. And uh, here is the bar chart for the same. And this is how the server looks like. So one can select the module that one wants to study uh, suppose here we started with protein protein interactions module. Then this is the very next page looks like. One can enter a PDB code or upload a PDB file. Uh, if needed, one can get this own uh, email uh, through email as well. Now suppose here we have entered a PDB code, say one day. Uh, then all the different protein chains that are available with PDB. Are listed. Then we can select the two interacting protein chains, say here in this case A and B, and we are now calculating the total stabilizing energy. Then we get a result, something like this, like the list of hydrogen bond energy, electrostatic energy, Van der Waals energy, some of all these energies as total stabilizing energy. All the residues that contribute towards these energies are normalized energy for residues. Uh, now, uh, PPTEC is a tool for prediction of hotspot. So, uh, as informed earlier, like uh, not all residues contribute equally towards the stability of protein protein interfaces. Some residues contribute more and they are called as hotspot residues. Earlier studies have shown that these residues exist in clusters called hot regions. And these hot regions are like the more conserved residues, they also add specificity. To the binding site. Now, uh, for our method, like PP check, it, uh, we use the training data set from LNN scanning energetics database, which uh, where we collected 192 mutations, 77 of them were hotspot, and 115 of them were non hotspot. And uh, after training, uh, we tested uh, the accuracy of the program on a separate data set. Uh, taken from the SAS database. And we here, we took a total of 126 mutations. 39 of them were hotspot, 87 of them were non hotspot. And uh, why this particular data set was used? Because it 
these particular training and test data sets have been used through various programs for uh, benchmarking. And so we found that uh, our program PCK was performing uh, comparatively with other programs as well. And uh, here are a couple of uh, examples where it uh, performed uh, better than uh, the existing uh, a very algorithm called KFTTV. Okay, where uh, in one protein complex, say one FAT, uh, that there are two hot spot residues, aspartic acid 58 and lysine 20, which predicate uh, from the other algorithm, but PPK could successfully identify it, predict it. And they, uh, for uh, this thing, uh, one can select the hotspot prediction algorithm, uh, the module on the server. Again, similar to the protein protein interaction thing, one can enter the PDB ID or upload the PDB file. And again, one can select the two interacting chain uh, for which one won't predict the hotspot residue. So all the hotspot residues uh, get listed over here. Now, the other thing is, uh, if someone has a list of PDBs or a list of, say, 50 to 100 uh, different PDB files for which one wants to predict the hotspot, uh, one can do so uh, uh, in batch as well. So here, the update file is actually uh, a zip file of all the PDB IDs along with the chain. Uh, uh, there is one has to input a text file. Uh, with the details, relevant details, and one can get a list for the uh, predicted hotspot. Here, say one KEN has a different uh, hotspot residue along with uh, the another PDB ID, which is one KEN. Now, PP check as a tool to perform computational LNN scanning. So, uh, what LNN scanning is, it's like uh, come to finding out the Changes in binding energy when a particular residue is mutated to LNE. And so, usually, if the changes in binding energy is more than 2 kilocalories per mole, it's considered as a hotspot. So, uh, here is a graph floating uh, computational LNE scaling data uh, with the experimental uh, delta G value. And one can see there is a good correlation between the two. Now, uh, through the module, uh, again, and enter the PDB ID or uh, upload, a, upload any of the protein protein complex, select the file, okay, select the chains, uh, interacting one, and again, one can select. Uh, so, there will be a list of many uh, interface residues. You can select the residue which you want to mutate to LNA and then see. The changes in the binding energy. So here one can see that the total energy of the complex before uh, was say here negative to 937 uh, kilo per kilo use per mole. Here after mutation, the difference was 0 0.58. So this is ideally not a uh, hotspot residue. Uh, so these are the biggest modules and uh, thank you. Thank you, Anshul. Thank you for uh, covering uh, the usefulness of PP check and also to take uh, the people through how to use it uh, and how I, I'm sure uh, you made it uh, user friendly, but we are, as always, we are open to uh, getting some feedback. Uh, so this is um, the set of talks which we are presenting today. And uh, to uh, just conclude, uh, let me also uh, tell that uh, where the people are as we speak, you know, there are four speakers who have come online uh, today. First story was on the cusp and it was presented by Sandhya Sankaran and she's currently a faculty and in fact the head of department uh, in MS Ramaya University of uh, Applied uh, Bio, uh, Applied Sciences and then the DOCS score 
uh, was uh, developed by uh, Dr. Soni Malhotra. And uh, she, uh, like I said last week, she is currently in the Science and Technology Facilities Council, uh, UK Research and Innovation. And uh, it was presented by Levati, who is a, a current student now. And uh, also the last uh, and the last but one stories, which were somewhat related, are the PP check and the call check. In fact, we went in the opposite order, which first talked about the call check. And that was presented by Margaret. And she's currently a researcher at the, mass, uh, at the MGH at Harvard. And um, PP check was presented by Anshul Sukwa. And some of you who have been here long enough, say it's since 2009, will recall that every time uh, there is a photographic competition, uh, invariably Anshul is the winner. And uh, this was uh, not by chance, but it also paved a way for his future career because now he has decided to be an official photographer and he's hugely successful. And I'm so proud to uh, have. Um, been able to talk about each of my ex students who have participated in these six seminars so far. And uh, in fact, uh, since we are um, thinking, um, kind of pausing and looking at our 25th year of the lab, uh, it also uh, helps us to realize who are all the people behind uh, these works and also to whom you can talk to in future, not only me, but you can talk to each and every one of them because uh, they are the authorities in this work and where. Thank you. And uh, I would now like to request uh, Vikas uh, to present uh, the list of papers that are relevant uh, in uh, respect to today's seminar. And he will also announce the topics uh, for uh, the next uh, week's sem seminar. And uh, in the interest of time, we had taken the questions online and answered them as much as possible. But if anyone else had any more questions, please feel free to uh, raise your hand so that we can uh, unmute you and you can ask your question or you can put it on the chat box uh, because please thank you ma'am so these are the list of relevant references for uh, today's stories uh, we have heard initially from the sandhya regarding the cast algorithm and these are the two publications from sandhya itself. and later on we moved on and heard the story about the doc score uh, which was initially developed by sony but was presented by the Revdi. And it can be accessed uh, to, and it can be read up more about uh, for in this paper. And later we heard about protein protein interactions like hotspots and also the another tool called PP check from Anshul. Uh, these are the publications related to PPI and also for the, for the PP check. And also we heard from uh, Margaret about the coil check and the related uh, tools like coil check plus and Chaho. And these are the publications regarding the, uh, those. Are Tools. And uh, also uh, next week, uh, we'll have another uh, exciting talk regarding the identification of uh, structural domains and the development of a uh, algorithm for the same task. So stay tuned. Okay. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Vikas. Uh, and uh, I don't see uh, any raised hands or any fresh questions, but uh, there have been a number of questions and uh, we are uh, glad to uh, have been able to address them. Uh, and uh, uh, we would like to thank the communications office and the instrumentation in SPSTFR and all, all the members of the core team, and all the speakers for today. And plus, uh, last but not the least, uh, the audience, because uh, you've been so patient to hear our four stories today. And uh, we look forward to um, discussing uh, with you uh, next week and so until then please stay safe and we'll see you next week same time or stay safe bye